We do have Spanish translation available, and I see Sandra Trujillo is here. Good morning. Buenos días. Mi nombre es Sandra Trujillo y soy la intérprete para la reunión de esta mañana. Si alguien necesita de los servicios de interpretación, por favor indique para poderles asistir. Gracias. Thank you. Gracias. And we also have headsets for the hearing impaired, and if anyone would like one, please let us know. This is the time for public comment. Um, this, this is the time for comment on items that are not on the agenda. We don't have a consent agenda today, but are within the purview of the school board. And I don't know if we have any public comments. We don't no. have any, no. Um, perhaps we'll have some when we get to our next item, which is the report on the results of the parcel tax survey. And Dr. Cash, I see you're going to lead us off on this one. Absolutely. I'm really happy to introduce our consultant, Brian Godby, who his firm was responsible for conducting the parcel tax survey for the 2008 parcel tax and also came back and did it again, um, conducted the survey this past month. So, Brian. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Cash. Um, and members of the board, I am pleased to be here uh, Yet again, uh, this is the third time, uh, also the bond measure uh, in 2010. I'm also pleased to be here because this is pretty good news. Um, and I think the board has some options, um, and, and I think they're, they're good ones. So uh, without further ado, and I think I've got everything organized, I'll just jump in. Uh, as we all know, the purpose of this was to uh, assess voter support for um, the two measures uh, that would be renewing and potentially increasing them for the high school and the elementary district, former elementary district, I guess is the right term, parcel tax, uh, looking at the tax rates uh, and what would be the maximum duration that voters are interested in, looking at various projects and programs that, uh, that are most supported by the voters, looking at both supporting and opposing statements, because we live in a real world and we just can't talk about all the positive stuff. And then, of course, there's a, a great deal of demographic data, uh, which we can cross-tab all of that by. We've done a little bit of that in this presentation, but uh, because the cross-tabs are about 600 pages long, uh, we're going to leave that to a, a later electronic review rather than a PowerPoint presentation today. Uh, in terms of the methodology, this is, of course, a telephone interview again, uh, as we've done in the past. Uh, the overall universe was the 89,000 and change likely voters in the November uh, election. Uh, but within that, we also have the June election. Uh, and then within that, we also have uh, the elementary portion uh, as well as the entire high school portion. So I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, we were in the field in early December from the 3rd through the 6th. Uh, the average survey was 17 minutes long. And then, as I mentioned, the sampling strategy is sort of complicated. And for those of you that have heard me talk about this in the previous parcel tax survey and in the bond survey, uh, the goal is to look at both districts, the elementary district as a standalone and the, the whole high school with the elementary district, of course, as a subset of that, but then also look at the June election, which is a subset of the November election. So we've got a couple different subsets going on here. Uh, and this chart is an effort to explain that. Uh, if we look at the upper, uh, this area right here, this shows you the total sample of 708 completed interviews, uh, and that would represent the high school district in November. Uh, if we move over to the, um, the left in that same green bar, it shows us what the high school district sample is in the June election. So that's only 500. Uh, but that's still an excellent sample, and we have a, a rate of 4.4%. Uh, if we go down to the next, the Burgundy bar, that shows you the number of interviews completed in the elementary district alone uh, in both the November and June election. And our goal is to make sure that this bottom corner sort of on the left uh, the 300 interviews is sufficient interviews to look at an elementary school measure by itself in the smallest election, which is June, and we've done that by having 300 interviews in there. Would we like to have a thousand? Sure, but there are budgets in real world, and we have to deal with that as well. I think this is an excellent strategy and a use of dollars uh, to get an error rate of six percent in that smallest group, uh, but then also, uh, you know be able to cover the larger universes, which uh, going into this survey we knew we needed to cover. Uh, any questions about methodology before I go on? <clears throat> okay, great. So uh, jumping right into it, uh, the first question 
is our uninformed support for the high school district uh, as a whole. And uh, we've got, because we did the June and November, uh, we've got both of those uh, results shown in this chart. Uh, as you can see, we've got 72% yes in June and 73% yes in November. The way we ask this question is actually, would you vote yes or no? We get that answer and then we break it down and drill down into the next level, which is, is that definitely yes or probably yes? So it is correct, uh, and we've been doing it this way for uh, 25 years now, it's correct to add the two together uh, and get a total yes or a total no. That's of course what's on the ballot. There's no definitely yes or probably yes. Um, uh, but what we, the reason we do that is we want to make sure we understand how soft is our support. Uh, we know that they're yes voters, but we want to make sure that, um, that we understand w where we're potentially going. Um, these are great numbers. I mean, the only thing they know about this measure at this point from the survey is what's in that white box on the right-hand side. Now, to explain one more thing, and I think we've talked about this um, before, but the reason we put the June model in here uh, is because November is going to, well, we did the first parcel tax in November of 2008, and that was a great election environment. And for many districts, for a decade and a half, that was the way to go. The world changed in 2008, 2009, probably more 2009. Um, and so this November's election is not going to be the same environment as it was, not just because of the economy, but because of the politics surrounding the economy and the politics surrounding the presidential debate. Um, in addition, there are going to be several uh, tax measures on the statewide ballot. It's no longer just the governor's sales tax, which will largely benefit education, but will also help the counties. Um, but there are potentially four other measures. Uh, and, and my fear and many of my colleagues in the consulting and polling in, in, uh, world uh, believe it's going to be very complicated if somebody is saying in a statewide media campaign, vote for my tax, not the other one. Um, and I think it's likely, and this is just my guess, I don't have a crystal ball, that there's going to be at least two tax measures on the statewide ballot. The governor's measure will get on the ballot um, and likely the Chamber of Commerce measure. And the Chamber of Commerce measure is the one that's confusing because it's a tax decrease and it's a tax increase on service providers that aren't paying sales tax or aren't charging sales tax now. Uh, so that's where this message is, becomes very, very complicated. Um, and in the charged political environment that November will be, our view has been if we have supportive numbers in June, let's run to June. If we don't have supportive numbers, well, then we have to deal with all of that. But we have supportive numbers. Uh, and, and I think that's the key takeaway for today. Uh, this is the elementary measure, uh, and, and we see virtually the same thing. Actually, the support is a little higher. Statistically, it's not significant. Numerically, it is higher. Uh, we're at 77% in June uh, and 75% um, in November. Uh, again, great places to begin um, a parcel tax measure. In 2008, that was 76% yes. Uh, versus 20% no, so virtually at the same spot. Um, and we know we went on to be successful uh, in the November election. That was that 76% was reflective of November, not June. Uh, but uh, these data show that there's no difference in the two election environments. Uh, now I'm going to show a lot of charts uh, that all seem to look the same, uh, but I'll try to make uh, make sense of them. Uh, after we asked the basic ballot question, we then went back and said, okay, well, we're not sure what the tax rate's going to be now. So in a Dutch auction fashion, uh, and what a Dutch auction is is where you start high and work low, uh, we asked people about different tax rates. We started at 65, went down to 54, went down then to 43, and then down to 32. We specifically go down because if you go up, the second number is a loser because why would anybody pay more? Uh, but when you're going down, they don't know how far you're going down, uh, and there we get more straightforward responses to find the tipping point. Um, at $65, uh, we get 67%. That's a really good number. I've got school districts, well, I did a presentation last night in Northern California before I flew down here, uh, that we were in the 40s on their first tax amount. Uh, typically, the first tax amount, because there's what's called a context bias, uh, is a throwaway, if you will because people know we're playing a bargaining game. They don't necessarily know we're going down in order, but they know it's a bargaining game. And they just say no. But clearly you've got a lot of people that are saying yes, uh, even at the highest amount. 
When we go to $54 for the high school measure, uh, we get set back to 76, which is what we had in the ballot question. Um, and that's significant because a lot of times we don't actually get back to the same level that we had in the ballot question because this is focusing on dollars. That was focusing on what the benefits are and what the features are, and by the way, the dollars are at the end. Um, so uh, very often this number that we're looking for is lower, and here it's not. So people are, are, are very supportive at that $54 level. Clearly as we go down, uh, we get additional support down to uh, 80, or up to 82% at $32. Uh, this is the same table for November. That was the table for June for the high school, and this is where it all really starts looking the same. Uh, and the point is, of course, that at $54, we're at virtually the same level. We're at 77% here um, as well. Now we'll do two charts for the elementary. This is for the June election. Uh, and skipping all the preamble, $54, we're at 79%. We're actually a little higher than we were on the ballot question. So that's great news, um, meaning that we've got some room. We certainly have room to cover the air rates that we were talking about at the beginning, even in the June election, which had that 6% air rate. If we subtract 6% from 79, we're at 73. That covers the air rate as well as giving us uh, a substantial six-point cushion uh, over the two-thirds majority that we need. Uh, would we like to have a bigger cushion after the air rate? Yeah. Does it ever happen? No. These, these are among the best numbers that we've seen. Um, so they're very, very encouraging. Uh, and then in November, again, for the elementary uh, school parcel tax, uh, looking at 54, we are also at 79% again, uh, and virtually the same number. Uh, after we talked about the duration, uh, we then, or I'm sorry, after we talked about the tax rates, we then went into the duration. This is in much the same format where we start with the longest duration and work down. Uh, and you can see here that an ongoing uh, parcel tax would be about 60% support. Uh, we need to go all the way down to six years before we get to the two-thirds level uh, at 68%. Uh, and, you know, there's no air rate built into that, uh, so that's a little tight. If we go down a little bit lower than that to four years where uh, we actually asked the question, we're at 78%. Uh, that clearly covers our air rate um, for the high school in June um, and gives us a cushion. It may be that the real place we want to wind up is five years, somewhere right in between. Uh, tax rate is the most important. Duration is the second most important. I think really the big takeaway here, and, and we've seen this up and down the state, uh, is that uh, voters aren't interested in, in perpetuity taxes right now. Uh, they're interested in things that solve what they perceive to be the short-term problem, which is the state's fi which is your finances based on the state's finances, based on the national and world economy, which we all know is going to get fixed without any problem in the next months. Uh, we also know that's not true, <laughs> but that we're going to have a difficult time convincing the voters that this is a long-term structural problem for education um, s connected but somewhat disconnected from that overall economic picture uh, and, and so i think it's better to uh, to be cautious and go with the shorter amount i think we could do five years uh, based on this data uh, but we don't want to do anything more than six years for sure uh, you see similar data actually uh, again in November. This is a little bit higher. It's not statistically significant. It is numerically higher. Uh, at six years, we're now at 71 percent and 79 percent, um, but it's really not different. Uh, now I'm going to jump into the features of the measure. Um, and what we did in this particular question is we asked people uh, these items that you see summarized on the left-hand side individually and, and said would that would enhancing math and science education make you more or less likely to support the measure? Uh, you can see there's a less likely portion of that that's not reflected in the chart. Uh, we also then once we get the more or less likely we drill down an extra step and say is that much more likely or somewhat more likely? Uh, and we create a scale that runs from much more likely with a 2.0 assigned to it, all the way down to much less likely with a minus 2, which would be the extension of this chart onto another slide. 
Um, what we're trying to do here is find out what the average voter thinks. Uh, if there is a magical average voter out there, this is reflective of where they are. Uh, it also gives us the ability to quickly prioritize all of these different things, because this is, in fact, a very long list. Uh, and we want to see what are foremost in the voters' minds, or at least what are the things that they're most willing to support the measure for uh, in, in the ballot box. Um, at the top of this list, we have three items that are what I call the Tier 1. Uh, and that's enhancing math and science education, maintaining smaller class sizes at the elementary school, and science programs at the elementary school. Those range from 1.4 on my scale to 1.3. Uh, those are great scores. Uh, generally, for a parcel tax, if I got a 0.9 or 1.0 in some districts where we're squeaking it out, that's good. Uh, it's great if we've got 1.3s and, and a 1.4. Uh, those are great numbers. To give you an idea what that 1.4 means uh, in terms of percentages, uh, it's 64 percent much more likely to support the measure and 23 percent uh, somewhat more likely to support the measure. But again, the way we ask the question is more likely, less likely first. So we've got 87 percent that say, yeah, I'm more likely to support the measure based on that uh, until we drill down. And that's a pretty solid number uh, with over two to one uh, def uh, much more likely to someone more. Uh, so a great place to be. Uh, we then have a second tier, which starts with the fourth item, uh, trade-related courses prepared to enter workforce, and these are summaries of the full text, which is in the top-line report that you've seen. Uh, and that tier runs all the way down to the last 1.0 item, which is restoring electives in foreign language and at the high school. Uh, again, the, the 1.1s and 1.2s are very solid. Uh, the 1.0 is about the threshold where I like to draw the line uh, and say we have to have that to pass. Here we're drawing a line on the bottom side of the things <laughs> that we've got rather than hoping that we get to that for the top. Uh, so uh, we've got a lot of things that we can put in a ballot question. We have a priority in terms of what would actually go in it and then some of the other things that you might do depending on the board's decision on what the tax rate is and what um, what the educational priorities are sort of overlapping with these priorities. Uh, the third tier starts at after school programs uh, to prevent gang and drug violence at point nine. And as I said earlier, point nine in some districts is, is, is where we struggle to get to. So we're not struggling here with the uh, items above that. Uh, that's positive, but it's not overwhelmingly so compared to these other things. Uh, when I go all the way down to the bottom of the list, um, classroom technology, laptops, and tablets, uh, again, a summary of what we actually read, uh, that 0.7 was 43% much more likely and 24% somewhat more likely for a total of 67%. So the good news is we, even the lowest one here, we get 67%, but there's no air rate built into that and there's no cushion, uh, and, and clearly it doesn't have the same uh, same weight as having 64 uh, percent much more likely as we saw at the top of this list. Mr. Gobby, could yes. I ask you a quick question while we're on this chart? Um, I see that classroom technology is at the bottom, but midway up we have enhancing computer and educational technology. How did how do you think the respondents were making a distinction between those two items? Uh, it, it's a nuance just based on the terms. Um, and uh, I think what is going on uh, because we've started asking this question. Let's see, one is 0.7. I'll just look it up on my top lines and give you the full. Uh, the one at the bottom is providing classroom instructional technology, including laptops and tablet computers. Um, and then the one that you're talking about in the middle uh, was enhancing computer technology at 1.1. Let me find the full wording on that one. Um, enhancing computer and educational technology for our students. Uh, what I've wanted to do, because classroom technology has changed dramatically in four years. Four years ago, there were lots of school districts that were thrilled to be talking about smart boards. Now we're talking about iPads. Uh, and I wanted to know if the voters are with us um, when we actually drill down and are talking about tablets or iPads. Um, I don't think they are. Uh, I think there's a component of them that don't know what we're talking about. Um, I think about my father-in-law. I've clearly got an iPad that I'm using for this presentation. My sister-in-law got one for uh, Christmas. Uh, my father-in-law didn't know what they were. And I don't think he still knows what they were, despite the fact that we were both showing, oh, and you can do this, and here's them, and this, and this. He just didn't get it. 
Um, and and uh, unfortunately, the f more frequent voters um, that we need to deal with are you know, more reflected by my father-in-law than they are by younger folks. Um, so while I think there will be an adoption of the technology, we're not there yet. Um, and, and that's what I wanted to find out in this question. So moving on to uh, what is really an eye chart um, that I put in here just to illustrate the level of the data that's available uh, in that 600 or so pages. Uh, this shows the same ranking score uh, or mean score uh, based on all of these individual columns. So we're looking at party type for the individual uh, or we're looking at household party composition. Uh, for the individual voters home. So for example, I'm a Democrat, uh, my wife is a Democrat, so obviously I fit into the Democratic column, but my household is Dem 2 plus, because there are two Democrats in the household. So that's the way you interpret that. Uh, what this tells you, um, the blue boxes represent the top three numeric scores. Now there are more than three in most of them, uh, and that's because there are lots of ties. So in the first column you see th three 1.5s, uh, and then a uh, variety of 1.4s and then 1.3s. So it's reflective of what are the top three arguments or sets of arguments for each of those, um, those groups. Uh, and you can see we're across the board uh, in pretty good shape. There's a couple areas where the voters are a little more conservative and so the numbers are lower, uh, but obviously in, in the net that we've seen is that people are, are very supportive. Uh, this is available in the cross tabs for virtually all of the demographics in the study. Uh, this is in here. Um, we're looking again. At Madam President, school. I'm sorry. Could you, go back one, could you go back one chart? Yeah. Uh, explain to me the difference between Democratic and Republican, th what their views are. It looks pretty dramatic. Uh, well, it, it's not that Republicans aren't supportive. They're not. These features don't make them as m likely to increase their vote or more likely to support it based on hearing any one of these individual items. But in order to get to a 70 mid 70s percent, you, we have Republican support as we do Democratic support. Uh, we're now just drilling down on the details. Um, and clearly the Republican uh, support for the individual details is different. Um, in a district where we've got numbers like this, if I was doing a messaging program, uh, I would be messaging with the previous slide um, because these numbers are so dramatic and uh, the district is so supportive. In other districts, I use this chart to segment the messaging. It's not that we change the message, we just change the order of the message. So we probably want to do all of these things, or at least all of these things in the top half, but you can see if you look at the, um, go back a slide on my notes, uh, if you look at the Republican two plus households, the order might be enhancing math and science, uh, then trade related uh, courses and programs way down in the middle, and then, um, uh, enhancing computer technology, and then rehiring and keeping credential, oh no, sorry, uh, enhancing advanced placement at the high school. That would be the top four things that we would say if we needed to, uh, to that particular slice of the voters. Uh, if we were talking to the Democratic two households, uh, the top four things would be different. Um, and, and you can see which ones those are. I don't think we need to do that here. Uh, there are many other districts that, given the complexities of the political and economic climate, that we're having to really message individually to find things that different groups like. Um, and that's the purpose of this. So this next slide is still the features of the measure, and we're still looking at June um, for the, um, the high school uh, district. Uh, so, uh, well, actually, we're looking at both June and not June. And by not June, what I mean is the people that would likely vote in November but are not likely to vote in June. So that's the no column. Uh, and the reason I wanted to look at this and show this is because we're talking about going in June, and we want to make sure that there isn't some hidden problem with June. Uh, and so what you see here is that the yes column, which is the people who vote in June, uh, is a little lower. Uh, than it is among the people who don't vote in June but do vote in November. Now, of course, both columns vote in November. Uh, but at 1.3, while we're not at the 1.4 level that we are for the uh, November-only voter, uh, enhancing math and science is still a home run 
feature to be talking about on our ballot question. So uh, while it would be great if all of uh, the, um, the, the yes column were the same as the no column, we have plenty to work with here and it's much higher than most districts ever see. Uh, so I don't think there's a hidden, you know, June is in the 0.7 level uh, versus November, which is in, you know, the, the level that we saw in the previous slides. Uh, this next uh, table looks much the same as the first one. It's long and there's lots of uh, summaries on the left-hand side of, of actual supporting statements that we asked. Uh, this question is a little bit different than the features question in that instead of saying are you more or less likely, uh, we say here's some, some features or some uh, statements that are in favor of the measure. So it doesn't make sense to the voters on the phone to say less likely because we've said it's in favor, so why would they be less likely? Uh, in fact, there are some things that do that, but it confuses people on the phone, so we've dropped off the negative side uh, some time ago uh, and just asked, would, does this make you much more likely or somewhat more likely to support the measure? Uh, so our scores grow up a little bit, uh, usually by about a 1.0 uh, or a 0.01 uh, or so, and um, if we were looking for a 1.0 before, a 1.1 would be good on this scale. So the good news is <laughs> they're all 1.2 or above. Uh, so there's lots of things to be talking about uh, in terms of public outreach uh, that get people to support the measure. Uh, clearly there is a tier one, which is about a, uh, from the 1.4 at the top to down to the 1.3 or about a, a 0.2 before we get to a different level. Uh, and there's lots of stuff in there to talk about. Uh, billions in educational uh, funding cuts from the state budget, no dollars for administrator salaries, uh, raise local tax revenue the state cannot take away. Um, while that is tied for the first um, item uh, and Excel sorts these so there are minor, minor, minor differences numerically uh, that are not statistically different, in virtually every district that is either among the top scores or is the top score. And it's the money the state can't take away part that is, is critical. Um, as we go down the list, and I'm not going to read all the way down it, but you can see there's lots of things to, um, to talk about. The green bars are among the entire population. The burgundy bars are the elementary only um, uh, questions that we asked. Uh, and we have another eye chart, just like we did for the features, which shows the same thing. Uh, again, uh, while there are some differences here, uh, I think we're at a high enough level of support overall that we're not going to be drilling into uh, difference in partisanship uh, in a campaign setting um, during the election. Uh, but in order to, again, make sure that we're not missing something and there's not some hidden red light uh, in the June only voters. We wanted to look at that again. And as you can see here, uh, we've got uh, 1.4 at the top of the list and there are three, four of those. Uh, and then we move into the 1.3s. And again, everything is above at uh, 1.1 or above uh, that I said is sort of the threshold for a good argument. There are clearly some that are better than the others uh, for the June voters, um, but, but there's all a lot, of, a lot of things to work with here. Uh, on the flip side of the coin, we do ask uh, if uh, the negative statements, uh, opposition statements, uh, and this question is asked much the same way. Uh, we don't put an arbitrary negative sign in front of the number to imply that it's a bad thing. Uh, the way the question is asked is, uh, if you heard that the school district has too many high paid administrators, does that make you much more likely or somewhat more likely to oppose the measure? Uh, so the bigger the number, the worse it is for, for the, the measure. Uh, at, you, at the top of this, we've got a 0.7. There is sort of a, uh, a ratio here. You know, if we want a 1.1 on the positive side, we want half that. So around 0.6 uh, is probably a good place for the negatives to be. Uh, most of them are at that or below, but the top one, which I just read, uh, is above that at 0.7, and that is a 23% much more likely to oppose the measure and a 22% somewhat more likely to oppose the measure or 44% more likely to oppose the measure. That's a challenge. We're going to have to explain to them that this isn't true and, uh, and try to convince them that this is not an issue or, or at least be prepared to address this uh, if it does come up uh, because it is a potential problem. 
if we look at the bottom of this list, uh, the school board is ineffective and can't be trusted, and trust in local government is always an issue asked in this kind of survey. Uh, it doesn't matter that it's not true, but it's something that can easily be claimed. Uh, that's a 15% much more likely and a 15% somewhat more likely, so it's only 30% at least somewhat more likely, uh, which is below the 34% the necessary to defeat the measure. Could it be a little higher with air rates? Certainly. Uh, but that's where we want to see those sorts of things is down in that, uh, that 0.5 range. Uh, and most of these are uh, at the 0.5 or 0.6 level. So while there are negatives that we need to be prepared for, uh, they are not as onerous as we've seen in, in other districts. And again, I was in uh, a Northern California district last night um, that has passed um, two parcel taxes and a bond measure in the past, um, and their top number was 1.0. Uh, and so, you know, you're in a pretty good shape compared to some other districts. Uh, so at this point in the survey, we've talked about the ballot measure overall. We've talked about what the tax rate range might be. We've never really uh, answered the question after we drilled into those different rates. We did come back to the $54 amount in our ballot question. Um, and. Uh, we have talked about features, how we might spend the money, what the reasons for that are that are supportive, what the reasons uh, that, uh, that one might oppose the measure. We've tested most of those really in isolation. We asked people to focus on just that item and say, you know, how bad is it or how good is it? Uh, but at this point, we say, okay, now you gotta synthesize. You've heard all that stuff, pro positive, negative, dollar rates, et cetera. Um, you gotta decide. And that's what happens on election day. Um, you know, people here, claims and counterclaims, and, and at the end of the day, they've got to decide which one is more important to them. Uh, as you can see here, what happens is um, the top bar is the June, uh, the bottom is November. We get 78% uh, in, um, in our June election and 79% in our November election with information. Uh, that compares to a 76% um, in the November environment for the 2008 uh, survey and um, uh, we've not statistically significant, numerically better, um, but I think we're in an excellent position um, with this particular high school measure. And as we move to the elementary and look at the same analysis, uh, the November versus June, uh, we see much the same thing. We're at 77 percent. Uh, in both cases, it's a slightly stronger 77 percent in the November environment. Um, but 77% is great no matter how you slice it. Um, and, and since we're a little more than two to one, which is where I like to see in terms of the definitely and probably, uh, I think we're in excellent shape for the elementary school in, Nova in June as well. Again, comparing with 2008, these numbers were 74 and 23. So we're in much the same position for either election as we were in 2008, and we know that was successful. Uh, again, not to belabor it, I think it's going to be easier in the June environment because we're not going to have all those other things to deal with. The November 2008 was different. Um, people weren't going to have the same arguments that we're going to have this year. Uh, and, and I think avoiding that is, is going to be important. Uh, after, uh, because we didn't know where we were going to wind up, uh, it is a different economic climate, obviously. There is a different political climate out there out four years ago. Uh, we wanted to test a no tax increase alternative. We've been talking about $54, which is basically doubling. Uh, and we wanted to see, well, if we don't get to where we want to be with that, what would happen if we said it's just an extension? Um, we actually do a little less well, <laughs> uh, not statistically speaking, but numerically speaking. We get 73% in June and 72 in November. Now, this is combined. We didn't separate this question basically by uh, the elementary and the high school as we did before. People knew they were talking about the elementary and high school measure or just the high school, but we didn't uh, separate it out beyond that. Um, you know, it's not statistically significant, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. I suspect there are, what's going on here is there's some very strong education supporters that are saying, no, I want you to increase taxes. Um, strange as that may sound in this, this uh, charged environment that we live in. Uh, and then the follow-up to that was uh, a rationale of what would happen if we didn't um, extend the uh, existing tax. And it bumps up a little bit, not quite as high as we saw with the, the actual ballot question that we tested. Uh, and again, none of these are statistically significant, um, but uh, you know, we're in the same situation 
uh, it's not quite as solid as we were, but it, but it's still, it, you know, if most districts had <laughs> 75 or 74, they'd be thrilled. Um, uh, and I think you're in a very good position. But don't need to go j with just the extension only. Uh, the last substantive question that I wanted to show today is the current household economic outlook. We asked this question in 2008 as well. Um, and what you see here is that 13% of the June voters uh, think that they will be better off. 53% said the same. That's a total of 66% uh, saying the same or better. Obviously, there's 33% that I think they'll be worse off, um, and we're not happy about that. They're basically the same in June and November. Uh, however, that worse off was 42% in 2008, um, which I think is significant. Um, because 2008, when we did the survey in May, that was before the um, stock market collapsed uh, and before Lehman Brothers um, and AIG uh, were bailed, were closed or bailed out. Um, it's after the housing market started collapsing, and so that's probably what the pessimism was focused on in 2008. Uh, but even though the economy has not yet fully recovered, uh, you know, obviously technically we're out of a recession, uh, but people are becoming more optimistic, I think, in this particular district. I'm not seeing this everywhere, so um, this is real encouraging. Uh, there certainly were more encouraging uh, numbers on the news today in terms of job growth for all of uh, last year. So uh, if that continues, then one would expect these numbers to get even better, uh, and, and that that would mean that the levels of support that we're seeing would be valid in the later uh, environment in June when one would assume there are probably some more jobs being created, um, or at least it's not dramatically worse. So that takes us to a summary slide, um, which uh, I think I can summarize in fewer words. Um, at the levels of support we saw for both the first and second tests in November and June, uh, at the level of support we saw for the different tax rates, and, and I'm picking 54 because that was in the ballot question and that was supported by our tax threshold analysis, um, I think that you have a very, very strong uh, base of support um, and that you should be going forward with the measure without a doubt, or measures without a doubt. Uh, I think that it should be in June because there's no significant difference in my view between the two um, from a, uh, a survey or a voter perspective, there obviously uh, is a shorter time frame, which means a campaign, uh, independent campaign has to hit the ground running um, uh, and that there's a, a short time frame. But I think, uh, I think it can be done with this sort of level of support. I think given the fact that you've done uh, or there has been an independent campaign committee in 2010 and there was another one back in 2008, you know, there are people out there that are you know, probably familiar with how this happens. Uh, and so I think that while it's a short time frame, you can overcome that. Uh, I think the next steps really are for the board to decide um, if that's what they want to do. Uh, that would certainly be our recommendation. Uh, and then uh, it becomes a question of immediately starting the work to get this on the ballot. Um, part of the reason you all know we're here today is because the deadline in this county is February 2nd. Uh, in every other, statutorily statewide, it is March uh, 9th. Uh, but their individual registrars and individual counties have flexibility of requiring earlier submission dates. Uh, so we have three weeks, basically, to three, three and a half weeks uh, to get a final ballot question ready and approved by the board if that's your decision, um, and then on the ballot. And then from there, it's in the hands of an independent campaign committee. Um, I think that can be done, uh, and uh, uh, I think it's up to the board if we're going to take that path. You know, there are some things to be concerned about, and we talked about those negatives. And, um, but, but I think, you know, compared to where we were four years ago, we're in the same or better shape, really. So that concludes my prepared comments. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Gobby. I, I have to say, every time you've come, you've given us good news. And while I don't think any of us like to ask voters for money, it's really heartening to know that the people in our community realize that when there's a crisis, they're willing to step forward and support education. And, and we see that in these numbers over and over again. And uh, the state polls show people favor tax increases when it goes to education. And here our community is coming in at much higher levels than you even see at the state level. So that's 
really heartening. Um, Dr. Cash, do you want to talk about the timeline at all, given that we just heard about that February 2nd date? Yeah, currently the, the plan would be to have the, this as a conference item at our next board meeting, January 10th, with the idea of having a, the board having a discussion regarding um, both the June and November issues and also some proposed uh, resolution language that would be the, essentially the ballot language. And then we would have a public hearing on the January 24th meeting, and if the board wanted to move forward, then there would be action on proposed resolutions to place the measures on the ballot, and then we'd deliver them to the uh, county, <laughs> county elections office, muy pronto thereafter. Well, board members, would you like to ask more questions of Mr. Gabi or comments at this point? I, Mr. I, Heron. Um, was the question, I mean, I, I know it wasn't asked, but it's in isolation, you've got the secondary and the elementary, but what about a, the question of $108? Because there are voters who will be faced with $108, not $54. Uh, we didn't ask it that way because it is two separate ballot measures. Um, and uh, we're, what we're trying to do is model what happens uh, in the ballot booth. Um, and since the ballot doesn't do the math for them, they have to do it on their own, we don't do the math for them either. Now, there may be a, an opposition campaign that does the math for them, uh, and we do know that there is some sensitivity to, to some of the negatives. Um, uh, let me just scan back there for just one second. Um, Uh, we did have one uh, that speaks to that. It was a little um, less concrete, but it was that, uh, you know, why should I pay twice as much as my neighbor across the street? And we didn't say it's a, you're paying 108 because it's, it's the 54 plus 54, but why are they paying 54 um, when they're in, the, you know, the same neighborhood that I'm in? Um, and, and that wasn't the biggest negative. That was a, on our scale, uh, that was a .6. So that's just right below the place where I start to become concerned. Not to say that it's not a concern, um, but I think uh, it, it's certainly manageable. We've got districts that have gone forward in 2011 and were successful with much higher negatives than that. Okay. Another question. Um, throughout the document, the word enhance is used. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it might even uh, not supplant is what we used. You know, we're in a stage right now where we want to maintain what we have mm -hmm. um, and one of the problems we had recently was um, ninth grade math um, mm -hmm. we were faced with living up to our word and subsidizing ninth grade math uh, to a great extent because we miscalculated the number but because of that we had to cut other programs what is the, what is the beginning point we're talking about here are we are we taking the, the current education quality and enhancing it are we going back to 2008 and enhancing from that level? Mm -hmm. uh, I think a large uh, part of that is the discussion that you'll need to have in your next board meeting and in uh, the board meeting when you decide to put this on the ballot, should you do that. Uh, we tested both enhancing and maintaining in some cases. Uh, what we have seen when we have split sampled uh, enhance and maintain on exactly the same issue, which we didn't do a lot of here, but we do have both enhancing and maintaining, is that enhancing does slightly worse than maintaining. So if you switch to saying we're just going to maintain our math and science education, uh, I think you still get a 1.4. Um, uh, enhancing is a little tougher, so you know we set the bar a little higher for ourselves in reality in, in this study. Um, it, if um, I think there's a lot of education support uh, in this community, and we saw the just extending the tax doesn't get as high a support as the enhancing, so you might be a little bit anomalous given what we've seen and I just described in other communities. Um, so I think it's a decision the board obviously has to make on what the programs are they're going to you're going to use uh, any additional money for. Uh, I don't think it would hurt, and it might actually help if there is some ability to enhance programs. But again, you know, that's translating the survey data into your educational decisions. Um, and um, I think it would be a good idea to have some improvement if that's possible. Uh, four years ago, um, the board had before it very specific dollar amounts attached to different programs. 
do you want this program is going to cost this much money? Do you want this program is going to cost this much money? Will we have the same options presented to us at our next meeting that at $54, here are the programs and here's how it could be $5 to this item and $3 to that item and $10 to that item? At January 10th? No. Because that, to me, that was a great help in that discussion because they were, they took a 45 or $47 number and whittled it down to 27 and you saw exactly what was being eliminated, what was not being eliminated, what was what it included. To me, that was a very easy way to sell the program. Uh, just to say we're going to double it and raise more money without specifically how we're going to use it, um, y you know, we're going to need a lot more explanation. Mrs. Parker. Well, just following up on that, um, because I do have some questions for Mr. Godby, but I guess I'll start um, with Ms. Jete. And um, that is, of course, we can't, um, it's important that we not overpromise anything. And so we, we will need, by the time we take a vote, um, some dollar amounts on, on what things would cost to do. Because I don't want to promise, you know, the community clearly wants to talk about um, these uh, things that are sort of 1.1 and above, I would say. I don't want to... I don't want to go out and put everything on the, the list if some of those things are just too expensive um, and would take us well beyond even a $54 mark if that's what we feel uh, we, we should end up going for. So we will need a tie to that. And I just want to say some very specific uh, things on that, and that is um, one of the lists is, uh, one of the items on the list is smaller class sizes, both for high school and for elementary. Um, <clears throat> at the high school level, Mr. Heron mentioned that we had issues because the way the language was worded was, shall we reduce freshman math? Well, freshmen take every level of math. And um, I would be interested in getting numbers on algebra, high school algebra, instead of labeling it freshman and then freshman English. And I would also be interested in taking the master schedule into account when we're talking about numbers. So we have these weird, it's 20 to 1 for math, it's 25 to 1 for English, does not roll into the 35 to 1. I would be much more interested in seeing what would it cost to do those two classes at 18 to 1 so that when they leave their first period English class, they can be combined into their, you know, second period health class. Um, so that might, ha that might really help us in terms of being able to not have weird class sizes as, uh, for freshmen um, and for people taking algebra. <laughs> uh, and at the elementary level, I'm not even sure, you know, we've looked at the data, there's mixed results on smaller class sizes. I see lots of positives. I see, you know, things that say there's no effect. Um, our community cares about it and I feel like you know, it's probably appropriate to ask them, you know, do you care about this in terms of the uh, parcel tax? Don't want to overpromise something. This would be hugely expensive to go back to 20 to 1 probably. Um, I'm curious to see some other possibilities in terms of just overall reducing class size averages, K6, um, by one or two students, something like that, um, so that it's not just looking at the cost of going back to 20 to 1. Um, for Mr. Godby, um, the two big questions I have for you are, you're absolutely positive about June, I, because everybody else tends to say, go with a higher turnout, um, go for a November election. Is there nothing in the data there that raises red flags for you? Yeah, I don't, I don't see any red flags, and, and mm -hmm. I've been looking um, mm -hmm. in your district and, and every other one we're working in. Um, the red flags to me, uh, and I agree with the conventional wisdom, and I was one of those people that four years ago was mm -hmm. saying to you, you know, you should go in November. Mm -hmm. um, timing was a little different, but, mm -hmm. uh, but what happened to the conventional wisdom, and I'm not sure it's, what happened in the real world, rather, and I'm not sure the conventional wisdom is caught up, is November 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at the parcel taxes in November 2010, which is a lower turnout than we will see this year and that we saw in 2008, they got killed. Mm -hmm. um, and we passed a parcel tax in uh, the first ever in the state for the San Mateo County Community College District in June of 2010. Um, and it, uh, it got 66.7%, which was great. Uh, <laughs> it, it was a tough election, tough climate economically, um, but the political debate 
was not as um, was not as challenging as it became in November mm -hmm. in the next door community college district uh, literally on its boundary the um, uh, Foothill De Anza community college district we had a parcel tax on the November 2010 ballot uh, it should have won by five to ten points um, it, they ran a better campaign, they raised more money in a smaller district, they did everything right in terms of the, the press, and they got 59%. Um, they should have done better than their neighbor, uh, but they got hammered. They got hammered on uh, teacher salary, or professor salaries, uh, and that's gonna be an issue in November. There are gonna be, there's gonna be a pension and benefit ballot measure, mm -hmm. at least one. Okay. Um, and. Uh, and the other thing that was going on, and not to hopefully not be partisan, uh, but the the Tea Party conservative movement reached a crescendo on election day. We did better in that school district uh, in the absentee ballots than we did on election day. That's almost never the case in parcel mm -hmm. taxes. It's always the opposite. The same thing is going to happen in the presidential race this year that happened in the gubernatorial and all those congressional races, both in California and across the nation. Uh, and the across the nation part is important because we all watch the media about across the nation. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and, and so the debate is going to get more and more uh, pro-jobs, anti-tax. Mm -hmm. That's what we're going to be talking about. That's what actually, I think that's what we're going to be screaming about on Election Day. Okay. Um, we're not, that, not going to have that, um, uh, that level of animosity in the, the June election. Even well, though there is a presidential primary that's likely to still be contested mm -hmm. then, it's not going to be at the same level as it will be in November. We're, we're actually going to have a pretty hotly contested state senator, right. uh, Democrat state senator, which I could see going both ways in terms of it could distract um, a Democratic base that might normally support a parcel tax, but it also could really improve the Democratic turnout because there is going to be a huge get out the vote um, movement in Santa Barbara County in particular. Right. Um, and with two Democratic, uh, at least two, right? Uh, or is there more now? Um, well, at least two. There's yeah. going to be with at least two yeah. Democrats. In, neither of them are going to be anti-education. They're all going to be pro, both oh, yeah. be pro-education. <laughs> oh yeah. Know. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think that's particularly a problem. And they're going to be working on turning out their base uh, because the election rules have changed for the primaries. Mm -hmm. They're also going to be working on uh, independents and um, you know even moderate Republicans because mm -hmm. to win you got to win among everybody now mm -hmm. and it's the top two vote getters it's not mm -hmm. the top vote getter in the Democratic Party and the top vote getter in the Republican Party and all the other little parties it's whoever gets the top this could two, be really interesting yeah wind yeah. up in the November so you could have I don't know that particular race although mm -hmm. I do know one of the consultants working on it but mm -hmm. um, uh, you know it could be two Democrats there could be no Republican in the um, in the November election. And I do think it's important for us to keep in mind as well that we have feeder elementary districts that in the next month or two, I would expect them to start thinking about whether they want to run a bond or parcel tax election in November mm -hmm. um, that we may end up, if we go November, would be on top of. And, and um, I think it's likely that some of the feeder elementaries will be having that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, the other question I had is just the duration. I mean, we have a fantastic group that runs our parcel tax and bond tax mm -hmm. uh, campaigns that have done the past few. And um, it's so much work for them. And I know that they would love something in perpetuity so that this is not something that comes up again and again. It's so, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's you know, their hearts are in it. Uh, the entire community's heart is in it. I, I appreciate it. I know we all appreciate it. I just wish that there were some way that we could make it so that it's not such a uh, consistently regular burden. Uh, I think of it as an opportunity for the community to come together. Thank you, Mr. Gottfried. <laughs> Every four years. <laughs> uh, I wish I could say that uh, that could be done. Uh -huh. uh, the last time I did an in perpetuity tax was in March of 2007. Uh, and we haven't seen one supported since then. Now that was six months before the housing market collapsed. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were able to do that, but we were also able to do that with no tax increase. Um, mm -hmm. And now I'm not suggesting that we, uh, we would win an imperpetuity tax at no tax increase, because I think in this economic climate, people are just saying, why do they want it forever? Why do they don't need it? 
it doesn't matter if that's not true, which it's not, but, the, but it's hard to convince people of that. In 2007, in the spring of 2007, we could say, hey, we're not increasing the taxes and we just want to stop doing this every four years. And the said, okay, that's cool. Mm -hmm. We don't live there anymore. Okay. Um, here in this district or any other, unfortunately. So what about going to five years instead of four? I think five years is okay. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you, uh, you know, assuming this passes, that you mm -hmm. sit on uh, the five years and wait until uh, November 2017 or June June 2017, uh, because that's an entirely different election environment that we're talking about, and uh, you know, we probably want to do it in an even year anyway. We'd probably want to do it on an even year, but I think what the five years does is it gives you a fallback, it mm -hmm. gives you a plan B. If you know, who knows what happens uh, in the 2016 presidential election year, um, and, and maybe we lose a renewal then, or, mm -hmm. or maybe we want to do an increase. Uh, and, and we're way ahead of ourselves, but I'm just scenario planning here. Uh, you know, we might want to increase and we lose. And so we want to have a fallback and that five years will give us that fallback in 2017 uh, to do a no tax increase extension. Um, okay. So I think it's just more flexible. I, I unfortunately, and I'm sorry to say, it, I don't think we get to uh, avoid the opportunity for the community to come together every four years. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abbey. Ms. Limon. Um, I actually, on that, on something that uh, Ms. Parker said, I wanted to know if we know of any other school districts, whether it's K through 12 or higher ed, that are thinking about June. If, I'm just curious if there would be anything else on the ballot that we know of that we've maybe heard of. I, I asked informally my colleagues and have received no affirmation of anything in the pipeline. Okay. All right. And the other thing, um, and it's already been said, but for me would be really important. I know on June 10th it's going to come back to us for um, uh, another discussion, but based on what we've seen um, in the last year with uh, ninth grade math, it would be very difficult for me to actually have a discussion about what type of um, triggers would triggers is probably not the word the right word nowadays uh, would need to be in as part of the language I actually feel like I really need to see the numbers um, in because I'm in the same boat as my colleagues um, that have expressed the math if the math doesn't work I don't want to promise and I actually also feel that given that we've already had constituents and community members express concern um, about the ninth grade math uh, situation I actually think people are going to look for clarity in language prior to uh, voting in a different way that they didn't four years ago. Um, I think we already had an incident and um, there will be folks that will want, what, what does this mean? And we'll be asking the questions that they might not have asked four years ago. Um, and that would be really important for me to know. So I don't know in our timeline process if we might wanna add, I know I don't wanna add more meetings, but think about this differently because I also don't want to uh, put together language that's going to pass, but then put us in a really tough position once it passes because we didn't have time to accurately pull the numbers and assess. What, what numbers are you talking about? Well, for example, math gra ninth, ninth grade math was like, an issue. Like how much it costs? Well, we estimated that it was going to cost us X, but in reality it cost us Y because we didn't have a definition of ninth grade math. And because this already happened, there's folks in our community that are going to be asking questions like, what does small class size mean? What classes are going to be impacted? Um, and, and those are the things that I think would be important for me, at least, to know um, if I'm going to vote or recommend any type of language. Uh, I, I have to see those numbers because I think passing a parcel tax just for passing it, that's going to end up putting us in a situation where we're like, okay, let's look at the general fund or, or we might not have categoricals anymore, but uh, whatever it is, uh, I think it's tough. And, I, and we saw it in the last 12 months. I mean, it was, yeah, we had to pull numbers. So. Well, I think if the question is um, from an educational perspective on class math, class sizes, um, there's pretty clear consensus from, um, I, I would say, at least the high school principals as to what they would prefer to do in relationship to that. Um, and so if the question is, 
if I, I, I'm trying to understand this because I, I want to make sure I get the answer to you. Is the question how did the district define reduced math class sizes over the last three years, and then what did it cost when it after it made that decision, or is the question what is the smaller math classes going to mean going forward, and how much will it cost, or do you want or both of those? Uh, for me, the latter. To be honest with you, I think we already went through the geometry algebra ninth grade um, moving forward I want to know what small class sizes means who it will impact and how much it will cost and ensure that whatever parcel tax whether it's 54 or 56 whatever it is um, will actually cover our definition of what we're including in the language for the parcel tax and I would just say kind of uh, ironically um, from the um, ed ed educational perspective there might be more support for not having that on the ballot measure and therefore um, I would look to the board's guidance on how it wanted it defined before I could come up with a, a, co a possible cost because if you're asking for a recommendation from me in relationship to ninth grade math sizes um, my recommendation would be that would not be part of the parcel tax well, and actually, I just gave class size as an example, but if I, I could do the math and science, um, well, I mean, what does math and science, enhancing math and science initiatives mean, um, and who is it going to impact? So I just gave class size as an example, okay. but I think it goes back to what Mr. Heron said, that there was a list with programs and what it would cost. And that, to me, um, because I know on the 24th, we're just going to essentially approve something that we came up with on the 10th, and if we don't have numbers on the 10th, it's going to be dif difficult for me to actually have, um, to feel confident about what we're moving forward if we don't have the numbers on the 10th. So my thought is that we may want to consider a time um, where we do have the numbers and we can actually think about it if it's not the 10th before we actually vote on it on the 24th. Just Mrs. If, if Cordero. Might, just a, a point of clarification to help your discussions. Um, the class size question that we asked did not say reducing class sizes. It said maintaining smaller class sizes. So uh, if we keep class sizes where they are now, uh, assuming they are smaller, and smaller is an abstract term, uh, we are paying off on what the voters said to us. Now, is that the parent voters or is that the average non-parent of a school-aged child? Remember, the non-parent of the school-age child is the vast majority of the voters. So maintaining smaller class size, they say, great. They don't know what 20 means. They don't know what 10 means. They don't know what 40 means. They just don't know. And, and you're never going to explain it to them because they don't have kids in school anymore. Uh, so what we tested, just to be sure, is maintaining smaller class sizes, not promising a cut um, in, in both the elementary and the high school. Now, when I look at the difference between uh, the parents and the non-parents, or parents in the overall, uh, at the elementary size, maintaining smaller class sizes at the elementary school is 1.38, uh, so rounds up to 1.4 among those with school-aged children at home, whereas we see on this slide, uh, it was for the um, elementary, uh, it's at the top, maintaining smaller class sizes is at a 1.3. So there's not a big difference statistically between all of the voter, or the non-parent voters and the parent voters even on this issue. But it, what we did say maintaining. Mrs. Cordero. Okay, well, that actually was going to be a point that I wanted to make as well the, about the, the overwhelming majority of the sample were non-parents or parents right. without school-aged children. And so I'm not sure that some of the issues that we hear directly from uh, parents are necessarily reflective of what the concerns would be for the broader vo uh, voting population. But the, the other thing that, that I'm concerned about is I think one of the things we saw with the ninth grade math issue um, is that the, when, the more specific our language is, the more difficulty we get into, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, because, because our situation changes from year to year and sometimes from month to month um, or day to day with the way the state budget has been functioning. Um, so if we make a, you know, we can say in, in 2012, this is what, you know, we mean. But 
you know, by 2013, or maybe just a month later in 2012, um, that reality has changed so dramatically that it, it's not good practice anymore to do it that way. So I'm really concerned um, that we don't try to make things too specific. We need to make sure we're giving uh, ourselves flexibility to do what's educationally appropriate for the students, not, you know, a, a really specific um, concern. And so I had one, for example, um, uh, when we say maintaining smaller class sizes, um, you know, I can, it depend, I, I don't know, I, I don't know that we need to, to pin that down because it could mean smaller class sizes than neighboring districts, okay, or it could mean the reduced class size, you know, the state definition of that. Um, and I would prefer that we have the, the flexibility to use either um, definition. So I think I'm kind of leaning more towards maintaining, you know, language of maintaining rather than enhancing, um, because at this point, I mean, that's kind of where the struggle is, um, although there are some things we definitely want to enhance. Um, but just also some, some of the very um, nitty gritty details, uh, I think I'm definitely in favor of the June election for the reasons that have been brought out and probably for the $54 um, dollar increase, although um, that is a number I would like to see in terms of what when we, when we say that number, what's the amount we're talking about in each district? Um, well, so. yeah, we would get to all of you as quickly as possible uh, what, that, what that amount is or what, what I, I don't know if we could do. I, I'm trying to understand what Mr. Heron said. It, my, I wrote down it you would like kind of a dollar for dollar analysis. So if it's $28, it would mean this. If it was $29, it would mean that. Uh, uh, Mrs. Swarovski, or Dr. Swarovski, uh, did a great uh, report back in 2008 oh, that okay. spelled out all the categories and here's the cost of that. And then that was translated into the dollar amount on the ballot. And so it was, it was a, it's a great report to go back and look at. And my question again, just well, to make it, my, yeah. <laughs> one of my Saturday concerns days. is I want to avoid a situation where the first $27 does exactly what we've, we've been doing for the last four years. Because that first $27, you know, it maintains smaller class sizes. It, uh, um, it, a lot of those things it did to get us to this point. And if we start using words like, well, we want to enhance it, then we've already spent $27 and then we've got to increase it. So to me, the base has to be 2008 um, if we want to enhance something we don't want to, I don't think, enhance it from today. Uh, that's very hard to do. I, I, I don't want to be forced into spending money a certain way when really that means cutting uh, other programs that we might think more important. So anything we can do to, to not be specific, uh, but at least have a general idea, to me, is the way to go. But like on ninth grade, we hate, hate beating ninth grade class size, but that was a mistake. It was 285000 on Dr. Swarovski's report, and it turned out to be a $500,000 expense because of miscalculations, not because of uh, a question about whether, you know, what was included in ninth grade. It was purely a, a miscalculation on staff numbers, and therefore we cut $300,000 of other programs because we were tied to the language in uh, the parcel tax. I would like to make sure we're, we're not tied into specific numbers, but have a general idea of what we're going to spend the money on. And if we need more technology, what's the cost of that technology? And what does that translate to the $54? If we want more teacher training or, um, you know, more professional development, what's the cost of that related to the $54? Those kind of topics, uh, so we know what we're talking about at the time we make that decision on if it's $54. Ms. Limon. Oh, and I was just going to say, I think we're actually all in line with the same lines. No one wants to make promises we can't keep, bottom line. I yeah, think, that I mean, sounds that's good. The, and I think that that's where I wasn't specifically asking for too much specificity, but I, I wanted some ideas so that we didn't put our top five things in the ballot 
and then we can't do that. So I think that whatever numbers will help us better understand that, I think, is what we're looking for. Well, we'll, we'll definitely have Dr. Sawaski. <laughs> I, I like that she's got the honorary doctorate now. Um, be, uh, replicate her 2007 analysis um, with updated data, obviously, from the business office and ideas that we have obviously been kicking around about what we would do differently um, in relationship to a parcel tax. So, and give that to you as quickly mm -hmm. as possible. Maybe not um, today, um, <laughs> but hopefully by Tuesday, um, 5 o'clock, 5 p.m. <laughs> that would be really helpful. And um, because it hasn't been mentioned except by Mr. Godby, I would like to focus in on that trade-related classes because that did um, get a lot of community support and I think anecdotally we hear that a lot as board members. So if there are some programs, staff, that, um, that we could put a dollar figure on related to trade, vocational, career technical, I guess we'll have to struggle with the term if we end up putting that in the ballot itself. But if we could get a dollar figure for um, some of those kinds of classes, those career technical classes, I think I would like to see that in the mix. And, you know, getting back to the class size piece, I think we want to be careful not, if we say maintaining smaller classes, we don't want to lock ourselves into what we did last time. So that's, that's a real flag. Um, personally, I think that at the element, on the elementary um, item, it's much easier to talk about class sizes, and, and it has a much different impact um, budgetarily because you can say, keep classes smaller, 26 or less, or something like that. I mean, have some flexibility, 28 or less, however you want to look at it. When we start looking at high school, I, um, it's very problematic because it, 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 it's really disruptive to the master schedule, as, as we've discussed, and so I, I almost think we might not want to put anything about smaller class sizes in the elementary measure. I, it's just a thought, sorry, the secondary measure. Um, knowing that as board members, that's a priority for us and we can still do that and we can still give direction to it. If, if we're not confident doing that and we want to put something in, then it has to be general enough that there's room for interpretation. And, and those decisions are then made by the folks at the sites and at the district office who, who feel strongly about where those dollars should go as opposed to us locking in, you know, a section size for, for ninth grade English or math. I, I'm really concerned about that because I think that puts everyone in a straight jacket and it makes it really hard at the site levels to work. Um, and that might be an easier way to come up with numbers. To, I mean, that way we're not asking you to come up with as precise numbers. Well, we could definitely come up with a, um, you know, what I wrote a note to, because I've done, I did, done this in other districts, is what does it cost in K-3 to add one student per class at each of those grade levels, or two students, or three students, or four students, um, or to reduce them from 25 to 24 to 23 to 22, and, and we can get you that sort of analysis. I, um, I, I also want to caution you, or caution all of us, that the governor has released his budget, and uh, tentatively, we all, if we had a chance to read it, we all understand that if the uh, November tax measures are not um, passed, there, a trigger will in, um, happen. And, it, uh, and the tentative analysis is that it's equal to 15 school days. Um, so um, we also have that, and we also have our contract with our teachers association that has both a ceiling and a floor that we need to pay attention to in relationship to class size. So, and I only bring up the, the governor's budget because uh, there, there, there may, be, you know, may be opportunities to look at class sizes versus 15 fewer school days sort of analysis. So I, I think that's, we have to be thinking about that, unfortunately, as part of the mix here. Mrs. Cordero. I just wondered for the, for uh, the tenth, are we going to be trying to pin down the language for the ballot on the tenth, or will we be doing that on the twenty-fourth? Well, my my 
my understanding is is that last time it there, there was quite a discussion about the language so my my belief is is that it probably won't happen on the 10th that there would be continued discussion about the language before if there was action that uh, action on the 24th okay okay so then but on the 10th then will we have a draft of language to look at um, what the initial proposal was was to give you last the last reminder of the last one ask you to bring your own proposals um, and then at that okay. point we would take direction from you as to uh, what additional piece of, you know how you might want to massage that or make it look differently okay um, you know I, I don't think anybody expected that we would be talking about the real likelihood of a June ballot measure at this particular point in, in the survey results which we got um, two weeks ago are, so we're, we're responding as quickly as we can and we have the county's imposed deadline of February 2nd so um, trying to we'll, we'll get as much of that information to you before the 10th and we'll continue to try to provide it to you all the way up to the 24th before it, if you decided to act on that day okay thank you I would I also add to that if I could uh, bringing uh, what we did in the past is largely built into this um, a as well as some of the discussions that we had um, leading into doing the polling uh, so keeping these two questions in mind because we know how they tested if we change these dramatically we don't know how they test so we don't want to go too far from this within your educational goals and obviously that's a board decision but then the other uh, thing to help you as you have those discussions is this list uh, and you know working from the top down from the voters perspective is where they want you to be now that's not a perfect overlap with where you know from an educational policy perspective you need to be but the more we can match the two of those up the more we keep the chances that we have in the poll um, so can, that's can I just problem. ask a quick question regarding your statement now if we look at for example enhancing math and science education if, if we were to change the language to something like ensuring quality math and science education, do you, would you I, um, imagine or project that that would significantly change the response that we might have gotten? Um, I don't think it would substantially change it. Uh, the heartburn I'm having is 75 words. Um, yeah. My version is, is one word less. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, and I think we need to keep that in mind that there's another piece of this, which is your attorney. Yeah. Um, and he, at working together with you and with us, has got to come up with a 75-word ballot statement, uh, which can't be 76. It's got to be 75. Right. That's it. Right. Um, and it needs to express the things that we know are supportive. Now, there can also be a much longer resolution. and, and I, well, I'm not an attorney. I've worked with many in the last four years and, and actually much longer than that. But uh, the thinking among the attorneys doing this now has changed a little bit. Um, and what they tend to be doing, uh, certainly for bond measures, but I'm starting to see it creep into parcel taxes, is the larger resolution has the educational goals expressed. Um, and within those goals, it leaves you some legal flexibility as to what you actually do with the parcel tax. Years ago, when we started doing parcel tax measures, there was 75 words, and that was the whole law. There was nothing else. Um, what they're saying now, and, and again, I'm not an attorney, so you need to talk to your attorney about this, but that this is a, the 75 words um, is a summary of what those educational goals that are expressed in the broader resolution, which give them a little more details. Uh, but there's a tension here between, you know, how do I get it all into 75 words to explain it to people so they support it, but yet also give us flexibility enough to deal with the educational goals, if not, uh, as one of the trustees expressed, if not uh, in a year from now, in a month from now, when things change or after the election. Uh, and so that's what the attorneys really need to be involved with to help you with that as well. Uh, but we do need to come up with a 75-word summary of that broader resolution that still sort of pays off on the things that we know the voters support. If I, if I could ask my board members if they would like to take a, a stab at crafting something before Tuesday, um, I think that Santa Barbara Unified School District counts as one word, is that right? Yes. 
Yes, it is. Okay. So um, <laughs> I know we did it up on the dais last time and it got really <laughs> involved. And so, um, you know, it might be useful f as a starting point for us to come with those things identified that we care the most about and we think um, comply most with the spirit of the language of the survey so we don't get too far from that. Mrs. Parker. My question is that the ballot language is due by February 2nd. The resolution and supporting statements, please tell me those are not due February 2nd. The resolution is due February 2nd. The ballot arguments are not due February 2nd. Okay, and the arguments are due when? Do we know? Um, Uh, the period for submitting um, direct arguments is the 20th through the 29th of February. So until and February 29th is the right. deadline for for the ballot for argument. for arguments. Okay. Yeah, there's Good. A, there's a subsequent to that, there's the um, the rebuttal argument. Because there's really I, the ballot well, arguments where we got in trouble, I think, more than our resolution or our ballot statement. So. And and I, and well, obviously, uh, the board is responsible for the educational policy, and the ballot arguments should suggest um, that those goals. Um, the ballot argument should not come from the board. It, it, you get five signatures and it shouldn't be one, two, three, four, five. Uh, it should be five other people. And I think you did that the last time around. Um, obviously, there's a combination of people working on this effort, those, that effort to get the best signatories matched with the best arguments. And, and what, what happened for us is that the, it was in the ballot argument that our outside supporters narrowed down, for example, the math language in a way that we had not done in the resolution or the ballot statement. So. Mr. Heron. Yeah, looking at that slide, and based upon the public's perception of this board, which I take to assume they trust us, or at least uh, somewhat, the very first sentence, protect quality of, of education, we are faced with potentially some huge decisions in the next four years or two years, and I would like to have as much flexibility for this board to protect the quality of education across the board. And when I see words like enhance math, supplement music, limit math class sizes, that may be the question you asked, but if we emphasize those three items, we lose a lot of flexibility. So I would like us to think of language that protects quality of education um, based upon the trust of this board um, as much as possible. And, and I think that's the legal, that, that's the crux of the legal issue. What, what do we need to put in the broader resolution that maintains that flexibility, uh, but allows us to have a summary that is more pointed, um, and not putting those two in uh, in conflict with each other. But that's that's the trick, and the attorneys are getting more and more um, familiar with dealing with this. I think Prop 39 has really focused them uh, on, on this thinking of how you uh, how you make one the controlling law, if you will, and the other the summary of that resolution. Mm -hmm. And I, I do think that the math and arts piece of H and I were hugely embraced by the community, and I think if the community felt we were going to remove English or uh, sorry, uh, music, say for instance at the elementary schools, there'd be a real outcry. So I, I'm, I'm personally invested in maintaining those programs that we put in place with the existing parcel taxes. I have one clarification. On page 13 of Mr. Godby's um, report, and you want numbers related to each one of these, or the top five, or what are we what are we trying to get numbers on? Well, we're, I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Sawaski's memo from the last time, and we'll use that as a template, and the three of us will work together. The only one that I guess is probably not included on that is the numbers in relationship to continuing. Our trade. career technical education, mm -hmm. our trade vocational. Okay. And then, and I don't know, did you do a per student cost in K-3 class size? No, and that, that was not part of the last time. So we'll, we'll include that as well. And then Ms. Parker mm -hmm. asked a question, and I want to clarify mm -hmm. my understanding of it. Mm -hmm. um, in relationship to high school class sizes in math and English, you're asking for the cost of reducing algebra only to 18 to 1 and English 9 to 18 to 1? Right. Okay. Got it. And algebra only is not, no, we're not talking about ninth grade only. Or are no, we talking I'm about talking that? about algebra only, not, algebra. and not trying to put a grade level on it. Right. And this is just a, 
So I did get that right. And I would never want to put that in the language of either the resolution or the ballot statement. I just want to see a number attached to that to see what, what the it. thoughts are. Okay. Any other board member questions or comments? Have we given you sufficient <laughs> direction? <laughs> Can yes. we give you some time? <laughs> we'll get as much of it as we can to you prior to 5 p.m. on Tuesday um, so that you have that. And um, we'll include just for your review the resolutions and the actual ballot language from 2008. Um, and we'll find uh, Ms. Sawaski's memo from 2008 or 2007 and include that as well so that you have that. Okay. And I'm not sure all the board members know, I'm not going to be here on January 24th. So um, just so you know. But I, I will certainly provide as much input as I can in our prior discussions. Mrs. Cordero. Yes, and it's, I will probably not be here on the 10th this Tuesday. So, um, But I also will give feedback. Okay. And Mr. Heron. The, the memo was June 18th of 2008. And if you have trouble finding it, I have a copy. Have oh, wow. <laughs> Well, and we certainly know how much we've been spending out of the H&I parcel taxes. So Yeah, you've received those reports every we year. We regularly know where right. that money goes. Okay, well, if there are no um, further questions or comments, I am going to adjourn this meeting. Thank you.